the life of God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, chapter 3, gunshot. Shortly after I recovered from my knee injury, I moved to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. <clears throat> I was not happy about it at all. It turned out to be a lot of fun. I made some great friends and celebrated my 13th birthday. My only injury in Florida was having my front teeth shattered and knocked out requiring caps, which was more of an ordeal than I would have imagined. We returned to Wish University in Houston after two years. My mom was not doing well at all, and it was getting close to her second suicide attempt. I was back with my old friends and did not have much supervision from home, and I failed ninth grade. I made my own decisions, and I rarely listened to others. After being set back a year at junior high school, I made a few new friends, which led to my next serious injury. My best friend was a Spanish-Italian whose father was from Sicily, and he uh, kept a machine gun in a violin case in his office at the restaurant he owned where his son and I were waiters. It was called The Godfather. My friend was the best pool player I have ever known or played with, an absolute natural. I will call him Antonio, but that's not his real name. Antonio's girlfriend was a Jewish girl. I will call her Rebecca, but that is not her real name. Antonio was a Catholic Christian. <clears throat> Rebecca did not practice Judaism, and Antonio did not go to church. I was a confirmed atheist, and we never talked about God or Jesus. Rebecca's father had, a, had foreclosed on a ranch about eight hours from Houston outside of LaGrange, Texas. Fayette County. LaGrange was famous for the Chicken Ranch, which was an illegal brothel that <clears throat> operated from 1905 until 1973. The business served as the basis for the 1973 ZZ Top song, LaGrange, and the Broadway musical, The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, as well as its 1982 film adaptation. T.J. Florney was known as the meanest sheriff in Texas. In the coming weeks, I would be interrogated by him outside of Shock Room 3 at Bentov Hospital in Houston. This is an excerpt about him from an internet article. It was the most one-sided Texas battle since the Alamo as 100 citizens watched disbelievingly in the dusty little town of LaGrange, their beefy sheriff, T.J. Forney, reached into a black 1975 Continental Mark IV and began to shake, by his $300 suit, Marvin Zindler, the star consumer crusader of Houston, Texas. That's from People, uh, June 17th. Next, the sheriff tore off Zimmer's blue, white toupee, waved it in the air, and then finally ground the rug under his cowboy boots. Behind Florney's fury was the fact that on Zimmer's last assignment in LaGrange 18 months before, he had filmed an expose which resulted in the closing of a critical part of the local economy, the Chicken Ranch, a legendary body house. Antonio, Rebecca, and I first went up to the ranch in the summer of 1975. It was a small ranch house and small lakes with horses roaming around loosened pastures. We decided it'd be fun to try and catch one of those horses and go riding. The next time we went to the ranch house was in Rebecca's father's Mercedes Benz. Two door. Two door convertible Mercedes Benz. I sat on the hood of that Benz with a lariat while she tore through fields trying to run down a horse for me to rope. The horses could turn too fast, and we never got close enough for me to rope one. What we could and did do on the next trip was bring guns. 
a 30-30 rifle, shotgun, and two 22 caliber pistols with holsters. As a backdrop, Antonio and Rebecca had broken up as boyfriend and girlfriend, and her attention had turned to me. I did not believe that caused any friction between Antonio and me, but it should have. It did not seem to be a source of animosity of Antonio towards me in any event. On October 5, 1975, we were all back at the ranch having a great time. Tony and I were shooting at cans with our pistols and practicing a quick draw from the holsters. We were standing shoulder to shoulder about three feet apart, and he was a little forward of me. Rebecca came up behind us, between us, and said she wanted to shoot. Antonio passed his gun to her, and it fired when it was going by me. The bullet went on a straight line through my bladder, intestines, and colon, from the front right and lodged in the back of my left buttock in my backside. I could see the trajectory in my mind. I fell to the ground and Antonio fell on top of me, rolling me over and over. I think he was looking for an exit of the bullet. I told him to get me to a car and get to a hospital. Felt like Babe Ruth had swung a back up between my legs. I never once thought of God. On a big ranch, there are several gates for different sections of land and different purposes, usually with chains and a lock. When we got to the first one, I told Antonio, drive through it. I told him to ram it. I knew I was dying, and all I could think of was, you have got to hurry. I didn't panic, but I had never been so afraid and had never felt fear like that again to this day. Sometimes I think I have forgiven Antonio for accidentally shooting me, but I have not and cannot forgive him for stopping at those gates. I'm still mad about it. I was seriously angry at him. We got to the LaGrange Hospital before noon on a Sunday. They had to call the doctor to come in. I asked the nurse for something for pain, and she told me my vital signs were too low. That if she gave me a shot of morphine, I'd drop dead right there. It would kill me. No pain medication. <clears throat> the doctor came and looked at me and said there's nothing they could do there. He told me they were getting an ambulance to take me to Houston, Ben Tobb Hospital, where they operated on gunshot victims all weekend long and, and do to this day. It's a, it's a trauma hospital. Many young doctors from Baylor University, all around the state, um, it, it's, it's a high desirable place to be because you're cutting all, if you want to be a surgeon, you're cutting all day long. I knew one thing with a certainty. I could not pass out or fall asleep. If I did, I would not come back. In an ambulance, I talked and talked to two fellows that were tending to me, as much as anything, to stay awake. I asked them such things as what it was like to be married, graduate high school, have a career job, but my mind repeated over and over, you have got to hurry. We arrived at dusk. This happened before noon when I got shot, so now it's getting dark. When the ambulance opened, my brother jumped in. <laughs> to help. My mom was standing by the entrance to the shock rooms in her fur coat. She later told me that since Ben Todd was a public hospital, it might help if they thought we had money. I didn't see my dad, but my sister told me later the whole way to the hospital, all he could say was, to God, please don't take my boy from me. I had stayed awake for some six to eight hours in awful pain. They took me to shock room three. It was filled with people giving orders and very loud. On the table, the nurse told me she had to put her finger in my bottom, which embarrassed me. And I raised up like a sit up and saw nothing but blood rushing from my, <clears throat> from my uh, bottom onto the table. You have to hurry is all I could say. They finished prepping me for surgery and rolled me 
to a hall in a line of others awaiting surgery. And someone was saying my name, and I opened in to see T.J. Forney, <laughs> Sheriff of the Grange. He wanted to know if I'd been shot intentionally, what we were doing at that ranch, did we have permission to be there, and et cetera, et cetera. I told him I thought it was an accident, and to leave me alone. I never saw him again. I didn't have to wait long. The orderlies bypassed everyone in front of me and took me to surgery. I awoke in a large room with about 10 beds on my side of the room and 10 beds on the other with other patients and I could hear moaning and crying here and there. It took a few moments to remember what had happened and why I was in there. I fell back asleep and when I awoke my dad was telling me he would have me out of there into a private hospital as soon as possible. It was the next day when they transferred me to the Methodist Hospital in the medical center where they had operated on my knee, and I had spent weeks there. I had a, a hose with a bag coming from my bladder and a colostomy, an opening called the stoma, which is your intestine on the outside of your abdomen, with a bag over it for going to the bathroom. I was out of danger from dying, but still very weak, and I needed to gain some weight. The track team was already getting together, running distance and cross-country workouts provided by the coach, preparing for track meets in the following school semester. I lived about a half mile from the high school. The day I got home, I walked to look at the track. It did not seem possible I could get back in shape. I was afraid to cross the roads to the school. I could not even trot to get out of the way if a car came my way. My insides felt like jelly, and I had been warned that too much physical exertion in the first 10 days could cause a stomal hernia in my intestine to start extending from my body. I was homeschooled for the rest of the semester by a private volunteer tutor and passed classes I probably would have failed. The beauty of that gunshot was that it changed me. I was never going to graduate high school, having so, failed so many classes. So I set up night school classes for the next and my last uh, semester of high school. I was 18, soon to be 19, and a senior. Chapter 4, College and Law School. Before the summer of 1975, one of my best friends on the track team who threw the discus and shot put in field events and was a senior, told me he wanted to do something big the coming summer before starting college at Louisiana State University, LSU. I was only a junior and I had no plans for the summer. He mentioned this to me and began thinking about how long it had been since I had been to Colorado. My father, who had really good years and many so-so years, depending on how the oil and gas industry was doing. And when I was in junior high school, he had sold some prospects that completed a few wells and had purchased a condominium in Pagosa Springs near Durango, Colorado. My friend's name was Keith Miller, and I called him Miller. He had given me the name of Say Babe. <laughs> At one of our night track meets, I was running the 330-yard low hurdles, and the last turn was behind bleachers where the officials lost sight of us for a few moments. A runner to my left veered out of his lane into mine and took my hurdle, and I had to slow down and go around it, yelling, hey, man, that's my hurdle. <laughs> I wasn't happy. I do not remember how Miller knew what I had yelled, but he was probably on the football field inside the track, uh, working on shot putting discus, watching me run and hurt me. I did not really know him very well at this time, other than he was the popular senior, senior, who knew everyone in stark contrast to me. On the following Monday, I was walking down the halls between classes. And coming in the other direction was Miller, though I did not see him. 
Then as he was passing me, in a loud voice, loud enough for everyone in the entire hall to hear, I hear, say, babe, that's my hurt. <laughs> Hence, say, babe. That began a really good and fun friendship, and I got to know the class I should have been in if I had not failed in ninth grade. And because I was Miller's friend, I was immediately accepted by anyone he introduced me to. I found out about 40 years later on Facebook, uh, I looked him up and uh, we friended that uh, he's Jewish, and particularly because of his brother. He's got a, a, an older brother and uh, they look just alike, they live up in Oregon. But I did not know that. It's not something we ever talked about. It's just, just, <laughs> I just didn't think about it. Uh, I'm sure he wasn't observing at the time. I told Miller about my dad's condo and suggested we plan a trip up there and backpack in the Womanichi wilderness of the San Juan National Forest. I had hiked there while in junior high school with a friend and his little brother. I had a driver's license in my second year in the ninth grade. <clears throat> the prominent 13,000 foot peak is 10.7 miles from the town of Silverton which began as a silver mining camp in 1873, and that is where I plan to take Miller. So Miller and I take off, we use his car, uh, as I said, he was getting ready to graduate and his dad had bought him uh, a Toyota, I can't remember the name right now. My dad's condo, It was about 60 miles from Durango where a train depot is located that runs a train to the woman that she wilderness to Silverton. The train is an authentic, narrow gauge, steam powered, coal fired, scenic railroad train ranked one of the top 10 scenic railroads in the world. It's something else. It stops twice in the same places to let off and pick up hikers and backpackers in the Animus Canyon of the woman at top speed of 18 miles per hour, it takes the train three and a half hours to travel the 45 miles from Durango to Silverton. Oh, here it is. Miller had a new Toyota Celica. And after a day and late into the night, we made to Pagosa, slept, and were at the train station before the first departure the next day. I don't know what the problem was, but the train was not going to run that day. So we couldn't get to where I wanted to take him. It's just too far. We decided to get a hotel in Durango and just head down the train tracks into the wilderness and explore an area I had never seen in but the maps. Uh, we got lost. And at one point we decided, we decided, let's just put these backpacks down and you go that way and I'll go this way. Well, we did that. We met back up and then we couldn't find a backpack. And uh, we did finally find them. We slept that night, and uh, we had a, 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 a big black bear episode because we, we had left some food out on the ground, which we shouldn't have done. And uh, but anyway, we, we ended up making it back, and we had one of the best party nights I've ever had in my life. We hit the main street in Durango, which is a, a tourist hotspot, and... Uh, we, we hit every single bar. It, you could drink at 18 back then. It wasn't 21 as it is today. And uh, we, we, we did. We made sure. We, it was like a go. Okay, let's go to every one of them had at least one drink. Shot of whiskey, border maker, beer, whatever. Uh, I can't really recall other than that. I knew I had been drinking the night before <laughs> when I woke up. But we did. We hit both sides of the street. I don't know how, many, how long it took us and how many drinks we had. But it was. A, we just had a lot of fun. Okay, I'll be coming to chapter, well, I guess it's four. I don't know. 
I thought I was coming up to the cancer story, but this is different. This is uh, getting into alterations while at school. So anyway, I was shot on October 5, 1975, and by early December, so it's October 5, and then in early December, they put my, I had surgery again to put my intestines back together, which which was, you know, it was dicey. They, you know, they kept telling me, we don't know we can reattach. You know, there's people like Bob Hope lived, lived his whole life with one of these stomal deals, and it's just a horrible thing. <laughs> They, they, it was successful. They got, they, they put it back together, and they removed my bladder too. The girl next door, who I had never talked to other than to say hey or hello, and who also went to high school with me, had been coming over daily, and she agreed to be my girlfriend when I asked her a few months later. I did my night school and graduated last in my class, or close to it, of over 400 people. In late December, I began running with the track team. Now I had surgery early December, and I'm, I already got out there with them, which was difficult. Uh, pulling two tires on the cinder track, you know, there's a rope, two tires, and you put a harness around your waist. But I had to put mine up on, high up on my shoulder. On the cinder track for a lap and a half, 660 yards with two minute intervals, six times was the toughest. My speed and quickness were still there, but distance running and my endurance, it took quite a while to come back. In early February, just about three months after being shot, I won my first 120 yard high hurdles race at a track meet that was fast enough to qualify at the upcoming district track meet for the regional track meet. Winning at the regionals would place me in the state track meet. I was fast, but my disfigured right arm really held me back. Then my heart was broken, and I cried for the first time since I was a child, best I could remember. My coach, who really liked me, he understood the effort I had put in to get back in shape. Called me to his office, and I knew something was wrong. He told me I could no longer be on the track team. I had too many semesters of school to be eligible according to the eligibility rules. It was because I had failed ninth grade. And of course, I had no one to blame but myself. Skipping school all the time, just not trying or caring about learning was why I failed. I was not lacking in intelligence and common sense as many people thought of me. I could and often did read a complete science fiction paperwork, paperback book during the school day. One day. I'd get them from my brother. I just sat in the back of each class and read my book, and the teachers always left me alone. I also was suspended from school a couple of times for fighting. First fight was in the gym in the bleachers with the principal on the floor telling us the do's and don'ts for the second semester of the 10th grade. This is two years before I was shot. I found out he already knew me by name, and I had never talked to him. The second fight was with the same guy, but this time we took it across the street from the school. He had about 10 of his friends, and I, being a, pretty much a loner, I had none. They were African-American, bust into school from neighborhoods far away. And I just didn't understand them or know why they even talked to me with words I did not get like word or say, man, can I hold a dollar? <laughs> <At least. laughs> that is what started the fight in the bleacher. I hear from behind me and one student to my left saying, man, can I hold a quarter? I turned around and just looked at him. <laughs> and finally said, I did not have a quarter. Bored with the principal, I undid my ponytail. Mind you, he's sitting right behind me, and I'm well aware of that. And I brushed my long blonde hair and then reached into my pocket for some chapstick for my lips. 
when I pulled my hand down with the chapstick, turned out I did have a quarter. Then from behind me, I hear, say, man, you said you don't have no quarter. <laughs> to which I replied, turning around, I don't have a quarter for you. The next part is kind of hazy. But I did know I grabbed him by the front of his shirt and threw him down the bleachers onto the students sitting below me. That is when the principal yelled my name and told me to go to his office. The next day, the guy and his friends were waiting on me when I got to school, and we fought across the street. The principal had told me not to get into any more fights, and this is the fight I got suspended for. I remember being in, uh, after my suspension, being in the men's room smoking a cigarette in a stall, and a group of African Americans came in, and they were talking about the fight. What I remember was, was hearing, that white boy went Muhammad Ali on him. My favorite fighter. I even saw the Ali Foreman fight in Kinshasa Zaire live in Astrodome in 1974. And some of my best friends in high school were African Americans, mostly on the track team where we could get to know one another. I still had run-ins with the general population of the African Americans who everyone just called blacks back then. I never used the N-word and thought they would help themselves a lot if they'd stop using it. Mostly I think they were angry at being busted in from neighborhoods far away. In fairness to them, white kids did not seem to like me much either. So yeah, I looked young even for my young age and with my long hair about six to eight inches past my collar I looked kind of girlish, and many people said that to me. One day a friend of mine told me what it was to him. You never smile and seem to be very angry, like if someone looks at you crosswords, you're going to come after them, daring them to say something, like you want to fight. My next suspension for fighting began in middle shop, and it was all my fault. It, there's not a big deal to that. The last fight I was ever in came right before I was gunshot at the ranch. The accident really changed me and the way I looked at life. I never got in another fight after I got shot. It took some of the fire out of me. My longtime friend from junior high school and I were at Memorial Park at night and walked down a train track that ran through the woods away from the streets and recreation areas. We went to the center of a long railroad trestle bridge that ran over a bio to wait for a train to round the corner from either direction on the single track. When a train would round the corner, we had to run and jump off the trestle after clearing the bio. We were drinking beer. As we were sitting, we started talking about the price of gas that was 44 cents a gallon in 1975. And anyway, the trains weren't running. We got up to leave, and as we're walking down the steps, he said something about my father and about how to find oil and gas. And I turned around and just hit him with everything I had, with my right arm. And I realized, what a stupid thing to do. I called him the Big Sweep. He's huge in all region. His hair was white and long and longer than mine. His hand was the size of... <coughs> And uh, I, I had nowhere to run. That was a really dumb part of the day. I mean, I couldn't move. I couldn't use my quickness. I couldn't box uh, as I had with the pedal across the street. <laughs> and um, he just he just took one big swing. He's very athletic. Uh, coaches all want him on the high school team, but he didn't want to. Uh, football team. And uh, But anyway, he hit me just one time. That was the whole fight. It was just two hits. My, my measly hit with my right arm. I let it fast, and I hit him where I wanted to hit him. Uh, but, uh, well, I say that. I didn't even think about it. But uh, he just about knocked me senseless. I mean, I saw it red. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that was it for our friendship. We just, uh, although after I got shot, he, he and I got back together a little bit. But by that time, I had met Denise next door. 
and uh, I wasn't going to be going out drinking beer at the trestle anymore. I was going to get serious, and that's when I set up my night classes and everything. The <laughs> big sweet. After the gunshot, I stopped seeing old friends, including Antonio and the Big Swede, and spent all my time with Denise from next door. I knew I wanted to be someone who succeeded in life. My dad always told me when he was angry with me that with my smart mouth, I was never going to be anything but a ditch digger or a lawyer. While he said lawyer in a, in a derogatory way, he got me to thank you. I'd like to be a trial lawyer. I had to get into college first, and the only school I wanted to go to was Texas A&M University. Anyone who had ever known me would tell you that I was not even close enough to being smart enough to go to any college, much less Texas A&M. I would tell you I had never applied myself to the task of learning. Texas A&M denied my application. I called them and pleaded and argued and finally admission said that if I came for the summer semester of four classes and maintained a B average with no fails, they'd let me in. I did it, barely. I almost failed calculus and got a B. Just a quick, quick thing on Texas A&M because it, it relates to uh, World War II which may, always makes me think of the Holocaust and, and how many Aggies were, were involved in that. Texas A&M enrollment began on October 2nd, 1876, and admission was limited to white males, and all students were required to participate in the Corps of Cadets and receive military training. Many Aggies served in the military during World War II, with the college producing 20,229 combat troops. Of those, 14,123 Aggies served as officers, more than any other school, and more than the combined total of the United States Naval Academy and the United States Military Academy. During the war, 29 A&M graduates reached the rank of general. Texas A&M is more than a great university. It's the home of the Aggie family with a long history of spirit and tradition. And I'm going to pass through all that. You can read. I, I got all this from Wikipedia. Um, oh, well, like Notre Dame, it's a school full of tradition, especially notable at football games and in campus life, drinking beer at the Dixie Chicken. I had a good friend in what is now the Volunteer Corps of Cadets, and we've been shooting pool and drinking beer all night. Uh, on the weekend and finally left sometime after midnight. I walked my friend back to the quad, Corps Cadet Quad, a large open area where people could gather surrounded on four sides by dorms for cadets only. And I dropped him off at his room. Before he shut the door, he looked at me and not for the first time said, want to race? <laughs> He's fast. We we, we race many times. I said, yeah, of course, we were pretty much, <laughs> we had a lot of beer. I said, yes. And he went to the end of the hall and took off at the other end of the hall. He was fast, but I was pulling away with just a few yards to go, to go and hit the wall before I could stop and busted my chin open. Blood's pouring out everywhere. People opening doors. Like, look, look, that's what the little guy did, the, the, the tall guy, taller guy. I also sprained my ankle. So, these are my injuries at Texas A&M. I also sprained an ankle so severely playing basketball with football players that I was in a cast for six weeks. Those were my only injuries in the three years at a and It was the gunshot that changed me, everything in my life. I married Denise when I graduated from A&M in 79, just three years after graduating high school. I went through it three straight th years. Uh, because I had those hours from the first summer, I just went ahead and went the next summer too. And I got out, of, and the average for most A&M students is five years, but I went through in three. 
And of course that meant I never dropped a class, which also meant I had a low GPA, a uh, grade point average. And I didn't realize how important that was for admission to law school. I was denied admission from every school across the nation I thought I could get into. I did not know how my dad knew about South Texas College of Law in downtown Houston, but he, he made some inquiries and found out the dean was a graduate of Texas A&M. And we're known for helping each other. <laughs> we set up an appointment with the dean. I told him of my uh, rather intense home life in wayward ways and that the a and had given me a chance to prove myself as a capable student. You know, he hemmed and on, looked around the ceiling, and gave me the and gave me the same opportunity a and had. Four summer classes, D average, no fails. I did it. I was terrible at chemistry and math, but it turns out I have good reading uh, and comprehension. It's probably from reading all those science fiction books in school. I graduated in 82 and I did great on the bar examination. Keith Ellis McCarty, attorney at law. Who would have believed it? Which reminds me of verse 1 of Isaiah 53. Who can believe what we have heard? And that's what any of my friends would say about me getting out of law school. Much less what's happening today. You go find somebody that knew me in high school, they say, Who? Oh, that can't be true. Get out of here. I know him. Forget about it. Chapter 5. 27 year headache. I'm going to pick up with that on another video. And then uh, that, that, that'll that be it. I have some general comments. Uh, oh no, 5 and 6. I'm not sure what 6 is. Yeah, 27 year headache. That uh, it's, I'll go ahead and mention God in one of these accents. I won't say anything about the dog who took a hard left between my legs. It's about severed my knee, my leg at the knee. I won't mention that. Or or hitting the big Swede on the track, unbeknownst to me, my arm just took off. I wouldn't have hit him with my right arm. <laughs> the things he has shown me, and 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 getting gut shot. Yeah, I think I would have figured that, you know, you probably shouldn't be hanging out with this fellow anymore if you're going to be talking to his ex-girlfriend for a minute. Little things like that, he controls my perceptions. Little things like that in my life to make sure I am the man of Isaiah 53. If anybody thinks I'm going to back off saying that, they're wrong. I have been through too much. My whole life is dedicated to this time, the day of the Lord. As a matter of fact, you know, what about my day? I said, what about my day? Well, he said, well, first of all, God's speaking with you and living with you. Most people say that's pretty good. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, here's, here's something he's promised me that, that he lets me uh, check out all the time. And I'm going to put on the screen. The Radiant GP Cycles, Shorties, Slip-Ons, Cold Startup. Thank <laughs> you.